on Capitol Hill. Diplomats deliver the truth about Ukraine, American arms, and President Trump. Will it matter as impeachment rolls on? Here in Texas, a court delivers reprieve for Rodney Reed. Will a fresh look at the evidence keep him out of the death chamber? And in the Bayou City, Mayor Turner's opponents join forces. Can support from firefighters help challenger Tony Busby close the gap in the coming runoff? I'm Greg Grugan, and welcome to Watch Your Point, where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, legendary reporter turned investigative media consultant Wayne Dolcefino. Next up, legal analyst and Houston attorney Carmen Rowe. In the three spot, Charles Blaine, founder of the advocacy group Urban Reform. Batting cleanup, longtime super neighborhood leader Tomorrow Bell. Next up, conservative lawyer and Second Amendment expert Michelle Maples. And closing us out on the hot corner, writer, educator, and radio host Antonio Diaz. Let's go. Taking center stage this week in the nation's capital, impeachment of the president and powerful testimony from multiple career diplomats. They confirmed critical military aid pledged to Ukraine for its defense against Russian aggression was placed on hold by Mr. Trump. It's one thing to try to leverage a meeting in the White House. It's another thing I thought um, to leverage security assistance, security assistance to a country at war, um, dependent on both the security assistance and the demonstration of support. House Democrats are alleging the president conditioned delivery of weapons to Ukraine on the launch of a criminal investigation into Trump political rival Joe Biden and his son Hunter, essentially using taxpayer funded foreign aid to gain a personal benefit. The president's Republican defenders contend that since Ukraine eventually got the aid without initiating a Biden probe, no wrong was committed. It didn't happen. You had three meetings with the guy he could have told you. He didn't announce he was going to do an investigation before the aid happened. It's not just could it have been wrong. The fact is it was wrong because it didn't happen. Question was the president within his rights or does leveraging American aid for personal political benefit amount to an abuse of power? I ask you, Wayne Dolcefino. Uh, first of all, I feel like I was watching some cringy HR nightmare. Look, this ambassador lady, I'm sure she's a lovely person, but she works for him. If he wants to get rid of her, I don't care what the reason is. He's the guy that was elected president. That's number one. Number two, I appreciated your intro, but that's all hearsay people. Can I, yeah, can I be honest? At the end of the day, I wouldn't have cared if Donald Trump called the head of Ukraine and said investigate Joe Biden and his son because somebody should. I, it doesn't matter. All this is a waste of time. And to me, the Democrats lose on this because they're not doing what they said they were going to do. Gee, what a shock. OK, let's face it. This impeachment testimony is basically a battle for hearts and minds for 2020. Tomorrow, do you think the president looks bad? Yes. And of course, he never will to Wayne because he got on those Wizard of Oz glasses. <laughs> and whenever he see the witch, he, he says, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me tell you, no, you might want to get rid of somebody at any time, but in this country, there are laws. You can't get rid of somebody, just get rid of somebody. Some people who have been fired uh, from their jobs on the stage, no, you cannot just be gotten rid of because they took legal action to rectify that. He was wrong because in this position right here, reassigning somebody, that's one thing, but you want to sit up here and demean this lady and talk about her and how she didn't do a good job to so uh, make sure she can't get another job somewhere else? That's petty. That's him, petty, petty Trump. Okay, Michelle Maples, you Respect watched what went point. down this week. Uh, you know, who came out on top? You know, I thought Ivanovich was a compelling witness. She was sympathetic. She was, you know, I liked her. But here's the deal. I don't care if you like somebody. She admitted that there was no bribery and that there was no quid pro quo. And now they're trying to drum up this witness intimidation because, oh, a tweet. Oh, my goodness, I'm so intimidated and scared because I got it tweeted about me. And let's remember that she served at the pleasure of the president. He can hire and fire whoever he wants. That's it. And let's also remember, number one, Ukraine received aid. Number two, Ukraine had no idea that we were talking about holding back aid. And finally, number three, they got 
uh, war equipment, these javelins, these anti-tank missiles that the Obama administration did not provide. The Trump administration provided that. So end of story, what are we doing, guys? Okay, one thing that struck me was the ambassador's testimony that, in fact, the president had the right to remove her, but did he have the necessity of destroying her reputation? That's Carmen Rowe. You know, I, I don't know that he's trying to destroy her reputation, and I don't know that it's witness tampering. I think he's defending against what she's saying about him and their transactions, and I agree with Wayne. This is an HR nightmare. This is about who said what uh, during the course of her employment, whether or not she was effective or not. But I think the most important thing is what we talked about last week. This is politics all day and the worst part is I think it looks like the witch hunt that Trump says it is when we're in the weeds which we are right now and more importantly we are talking to their star witnesses which I think it's important to note that they are giving us third-hand information their best witnesses don't have first-hand information that's compelling or that goes to any of the issues that are supposed to be so important and so transparent to Americans so I think I think they're losing their crowd Charles Blaine, in the ebb and flow of political opinion or public opinion, uh, who came out on top this week, you think? I mean, <clears throat> I think the ambassador came across, as Michelle said, very sympathetic. I, I think the problem, though, is, is that a lot of people are getting the two confused. I mean, as tomorrow said, you know, you can't just fire people. You can just fire people however you want. So I disagree at that point. But you didn't have to drag her reputation through the mud. I think that's the problem. And unfortunately, Republicans aren't going to come out and say that. And I think that's going to that's reflect poorly on us. I mean, we can. it's an at-will appointment. He can appoint whatever ambassador he wants. But there was no need for him to be tweeting her during the hearing. There's no need for him to be you know dragging her reputation through the mud and I think that's going to backfire a little bit yeah. I do think that she did come out looking well I mean when they asked about her family and how she's ha how they're handling it you know she kind of welled up a little bit and held back tears I think I know I but the American public who's <laughs> watching that the American public who's watching that they feel that as well and the average person feels that because they're not caught up in the whole political aspect of it so I do think she ended up coming out on top with this okay we all understand impeachment has zero chance in the Senate right so this is all about 2020 did it advance your goals? Yes, and I'm trying to find out from folks out in the community if this is having an impact on them. And I've been asking folks, you use the word average person, I'm asking the average person who's not into politics. So uh, my hairstylist is from the Ukraine. I'll, I'll let you decide if she does a good job or not. <laughs> and I asked, her, <laughs> I, thank you. I asked her, what do you think of the impeachments? And she said, it's really simple. We need to find out if the president's above the law. And he's not. And she said, you cannot ask the Ukraine or any other government for dirt and say, we're going to deprive you of this or that. And she said, too, she added, one of the reasons that she left the Ukraine is because it is so corrupt. So she can totally side with Yovanovitch trying to keep the U.S. hands clean as they're dealing with this nation where things are off the rails. So I do think the president's support is eroding slowly but surely. And the more evidence, the better, because people are getting it. Because the other thing that we're learning, too, is Donald right. Trump said he only hires the best. It looks like he only fires the best because Yovanovitch should still be an ambassador. <laughs> OK, Wayne, okay. Uh, forgetting, Tony's hair, back up. forgetting the ethnicity of Tony's hairstyle, because I don't really care. My family's from Ukraine originally, so I have the standing to say, since when did Democrats give a you-know-what about whether Ukraine is safe? I mean, the Democrats didn't want to give them any weapons, right? Can we get off this? Everybody gets their feelings hurt. This spongy nonsense. He is the boss. The boss got rid of the ambassador. Go and whine to Congress about how great you are, and it's, you're not running the country. We well, we're his boss. In a democracy, okay, the hey, citizens are the hey boss. Guys. We're going to talk about this again. <laughs> we got to go to break. When we come back, a date in the death chamber postponed. Will more time and a new look at the evidence save Rodney Reed from execution? Stay with us. Welcome back. The case of Rodney Reed has drawn a national outcry demanding a reprieve from the death chamber and review of the facts. Friday afternoon, a state appeals court provided at least temporary relief granting Reed a stay of execution. Reed was convicted of the 1996 rape and murder of Stacy Stites near Bastrop. In the 23 years since, evidence has emerged casting significant doubt on the certainty of Reed's guilt, including an alleged jailhouse confession by the victim's fiance, forensic analysis dramatically altering time of death, and a murder weapon that was never tested for traces of DNA. 
Among those pleading for more time, Eustonian Anthony Graves, who spent 18 and a half years falsely accused on death row before his complete exoneration. With this same team that's trying to kill Rodney, they tried to kill me. From the judge, to the prosecutor, to, to a mitigating specialist, and expert witnesses, these people were in my case, and they messed it up bad. I almost lost my life because they didn't do their job right. While prosecutors remain convinced Reed is in fact a murderer, the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles has also recommended a 120 day reprieve. Been waiting to talk to Carmen Rowe about this all week. What's your take? So there's two things that are going on here, and I think it's important to note that the guilt innocence phase and whether or not we execute somebody are two different things. And this case is significant, and the reason there's so much outcry is because there's DNA evidence out there that was not tested, exactly like Michael Morton, who is now free and walking around the same as Anthony Graves. We got both of those cases wrong in high profile cases, and Rodney Reed may be no different. But the truth is, is that we cannot execute people in Texas when there is a doubt, and there certainly is. The highest criminal court here in Texas, very conservative, said that actual innocence, false evidence, and Brady, or the prosecutor turning over evidence, are three issues that need to be litigated in the trial court, and that there's evidence out there that's compelling enough that we need to know the answers to questions that we don't know prior to execution. That's huge. And does it happen? Almost never. There's three cases where anyone has ever gotten within four days of execution and we pull them back and go into the trial court for more discovery and more trial proceedings. That's an unbelievable result and it's scary to think we were that close to his execution. Charles Blaine, was it right? <clears throat> put the brakes on this thing? Oh, I think so. Texas has the highest number of exonerations, and so if the government's going to take a life, they need to be absolutely sure that the life that they are taking is the person who committed the crime that they are accusing them of. So I am e extremely happy to see a number of lawmakers, both conservative and, and liberal Democrats, come out and say that we need to put the brakes on this. The Texas Board of Pardons and, uh, Pardons and Parole, uh, former employees of the CDCJ, I mean, numerous people rallied around this guy, and I think it was right. No one's arguing that he is innocent of all the crimes he is accused of and, and has been convicted of, but they are saying that there could be issues here and we need to put a hold on this and revisit the case. And, and I think they did the, the right thing. Okay, keep it right here. Our discussion of the controversial Rodney Reed case will continue after a quick break. It wasn't me, absolutely not. I had nothing to do with it. Rodney Reed maintaining his innocence from behind bars in Livingston. His November 20th execution date has been canceled. We continue now with our discussion of the 51 year old death row inmate and the evidence his supporters say should win him a new trial and potentially freedom. <sighs> Tamar Bell, what do you think? I'm very glad and I applaud Kim Kardashian uh, for the effort that she put forth. This is the second person who she has intervened on and to get this kind of change. I know a lot of lawyers and this just doesn't happen. This is a conservative state with a conservative judicial process and that they, they were able to halt this man's execution until they can review and be very, very certain that he is the one. Even one of the victim's relatives said he deserves to have a new trial with the evidence that they have discovered that did not come forth in his initial trial. So I am very pleased to see that this is happening because you don't want to kill anybody, you, uh, you know. I'm not one of those people who can absolutely say I'm against the death penalty. I had somebody murdered in my family. I'm sorry, I, you know, that's just my, that's just me. Mm -hmm. um, but to have somebody uh, to get an opportunity for a second chance, this lady, had, what, how many more days before execution? What? Wednesday. Yeah. Right, right. That is, that's, that, that's a miracle. Okay, look, uh, calls from both sides of the aisle. Ted Cruz said, let's take a break on this. Let, let's hold off. Michelle Maples, our second attorney, What's your read of the evidence and, and, and everything that's unfolding? So what is amazing that this is the ninth attempt to get this writ uh, to, the, to the Court of Criminal Appeals, which is the highest court in Texas for criminal issues. And it was remanded finally on the ninth try. They remanded it down to the trial court. So what was so interesting to me was um, and the Innocence Project, a great Kim Kardashian, yes, yes. but the Innocence Project yes. deserves all of the credit on this. Uh, 
what was interesting is all of these new witness testimonies coming out who uh, why they stayed silent during the trial God only knows but thank God they had a change of heart we now have uh, an individual who was selling them life insurance who stated that the fiance of the victim stated if you ever have an affair on me I'll kill you so thank God I'm getting life insurance or something like that there was also uh, at the funeral one of his colleagues came forward and he was a deputy at the Bastrop County Sheriff's Office a, a colleague stated that he overheard him saying she deserved it. She, he was cold and un, unemotional during the funeral. These are all things that should have come out 20 years ago, and thank God they had a change of heart because now this motion to stay uh, was the correct decision, and let's get this back down to the trial court and let's litigate these issues. Okay, Tony Diaz, I'm sure you believe that innocent men have been executed in the United States. You're steadfastly against capital punishment. Oh, uh, I think the death penalty is barbaric. It's state-sanctioned bloodletting. We look down on other civilizations. Uh, evidently, the Aztecs used to put people on an altar and kill them. I think that's equivalent to that. If that really happened, that's how history will look at us upon us the same way. Having said that, I really am glad that this was stopped. And that's the big problem, is if you make a mistake by killing someone, no matter who sanctioned it, you can't go back and fix it. And how can we dare to, to not suspect the same system that's unfair to black folks, Latino folks, poor folks, in the same year that two African Americans were slain in their own home by the law that came in and, and killed them on mistake. So let me put it this way. This justice system needs to be perfect before it can apply the ultimate death sentence. And I'm really glad at this moment that we have saved this man's life and I hope justice prevails. Wayne Dolcefino, prosecutors believe the evidence was overwhelming and that this, th this uh, execution should proceed. Well, so a, a couple of things. Number one, so Tony, sign me up for the Barbarian Club, okay? Because I do believe... You're the president. president. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm the president, okay? Um, but, but, but to me, look, we all know this sitting here. There are prosecutors who lie, there are cops who lie, right? The criminal justice system is very unfair. And, and while Tony likes to make it a black-brown thing, I'll just say it's a poor thing, right? No matter what flavor you are, if you don't have money, you don't get the big lawyers that can fight the kind of things that you need to fight in this justice system. So we can take all this color nonsense out of it. And, and I know Tony had to throw in the two cops that kill people. Why that has anything to do with anything, I don't know. Carmen. Button us up on this. You've heard the discussion. You know, I think I think what Tony's saying is right to the extent that we can't execute people if we aren't certain about the results. And I do think it's important that he's filed nine writs. That's something a lot of people don't know, that two of those writs have already been litigated and that the Court of Criminal Appeals has denied relief. And so there is some conversation out there, and reasonable minds do disagree about whether or not he's actually innocent. But everyone agrees that we need to be certain before we execute. Yeah. And that's why his guilt innocence and his... His, his eligibility for the death penalty are two different things. And again, the most important thing here is that certainty of convictions and finality is the best argument the state has for not testing DNA, for not looking into these witness statements, et cetera. And that just cannot carry the day when we're executing right, people that, in Texas. I'd like to correct Wayne, too. That's I did right. mention poor folks, and I didn't say it was just about color, but okay. that's who gets hurt the most. We're going to leave it right there. Straight ahead, Houston firefighters throw their support to mayoral challenger Tony Busby. Can the new combo erode the incumbent's substantial lead ahead of a decisive December runoff? Welcome back. Two of Mayor Sylvester Turner's biggest and most vocal opponents have joined forces. Number one on that list is implement Prop B and pay parity. Our fleet and facilities and people and our brothers and sisters are at an absolute breaking point. He actually wants to work, not fight, with our firefighters and their families. Mayoral challenger Tony Busby has sealed the endorsement of the Houston Professional Firefighters Association, which has been locked in a vicious battle with Turner for more than two years. Turner finished 18 points ahead of Busby in the November 5th election. Question, can the addition of a ground game featuring 4,000 highly popular veteran campaigners help close the substantial gap? Charles Blaine, question to you. Yeah, I think it can, but I mean, we're 10 days from early voting, tw uh, like 27 days or so from Election Day. If there is a ground game out there that can rival Turner's well-oiled machine, it's probably the firefighters. 
but they need to have started yesterday. So I'm really hoping that they're out there. And the thing is, I know they're going to be going after a lot of these voters who went for other candidates. And, you know, I do think that there's a little bit of a problem when it comes to Boykins voters and level voters and making sure that what I believe their second choice was Turner, you got to make sure that their second choice now becomes Buzz, well, their first choice now becomes Busby. So I think the firefighters are going to have a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to that. And we're going to have to hear more. You know, we're hearing about Prop B and stuff. Well, what's the plan to implement it? I think we're going to have to hear things like that because people are looking for more information. People are tired of the angry rhetoric and they want to know what's going to happen uh, after this next election. Tomorrow, Bell, you are the veteran of many campaigns. How's it looking? Does this coalition help? They had no choice. Who else were they going to support if they didn't support him? I, don't, I mean, this is not breaking news, you know. I mean, this this was this is what you expected. Now, as far as a ground game and coming back, the problem that he is going to have, from what I've been told, I don't know if it's true or not, but I've heard the Tea Party wouldn't even meet with him. So he's got to get voters from Bill King to come, who didn't choose him, to try to come to him. This the ground game, having the people. To work the ground game is not the problem. You can have as many people as you want. It's convincing the people that the ground game is trying to get to that you are the right choice. And that's some heavy ass lifting they got to do. Okay, okay. <laughs> Wayne Delgifino, is there a path for Tony Busby? Well, I think it's a narrow path, but I think there is a path. Look, the firefighters helped. They helped Turner win the first time, right? Didn't but, help tomorrow's but tomorrow's tomorrow didn't right. help Dwight. But, but tomorrow but tomorrow's right. I mean, at the end of the day. Um, you've got certain neighborhoods that have to come out and certain Bill King voters that have to come out. You know, it's funny in this city, we, we say we're not partisan, we don't have partisan elections. Yeah, we do, okay? I mean, at the end of the day, there's only two or three boxes of big groups in this town, right? There's like a, uh, there's a Republican box, there's a black box, there's the gay box. I mean, everyone knows that in this world. There's, there's only so many coalitions you get together with people. Uh, and I think it's going to be tough, but I think people don't like Turner. They're just not convinced that Busby yet can do the job. Well, wait a second, tomorrow, because I want to hear from Michelle Maples, because it's voters like you who Busby's going to have to convince to get out. Correct. And I mean, I was not shocked that the firefighters lended their support behind Busby, right? Because who else were they going to go for? The guy that wouldn't give him a raise. Uh, but I, what I do like about Busby is that he came out and he said, "Look, I'm going to get, I'm going to implement pay parity, and I'm going to basically respect the will of the voters because the voters overwhelmingly supported Prop B." And so that's good uh, that he came out and said, "I'm going to do it." End of story. Uh, now, with regards to the ground game, he's absolutely going to have to go and he's going to have to flirt with the Bill King voters. He's going to have to flirt with the Dwight Boykins <laughs> voters. He's going to have to flirt with the Sioux Levels because without them, right. he's, he doesn't have a path forward. Okay, I got 30 seconds. Go. All right. Listen, what he said about the partisan, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Wayne, more than it, I'm serious. Because one thing I love about the city election is that it is supposed to be nonpartisan. When you sit around that horseshoe, there's not supposed to be a D or R when you are thinking about the good of the, of the city. Right. That's, not so, that's not what's happening. That's right. And that is deeply concerning for me as somebody who goes for free to help the city get better at what they're supposed to do, which is serve the people. And if we don't get past that, I mean, a divided house is not going to stand. I got to leave it there. Got to leave it there. Welcome back. In the hotly contested race for city council at large position one, a finalist has emerged from the pack armed with a compelling resume and demonstrated desire to serve. First generation American Rice graduate, award winning math instructor, Obama intern, and Harvard educated attorney Raj Salhotra is seeking public office with a platform of progressive solutions. Rush, welcome to the hot seat, man. Thanks for having me, Greg. I appreciate it. Okay, something you said to voters clearly connected because you're still in this thing. What was it about your message that resonated? I think a couple of things. I think one was our focus on accessibility. You know, I gave everybody my personal cell phone number because I believe we need that connection between elected officials and constituents. And then I think the second thing is we're pretty solutions oriented from day one about specific policy ideas that we have that we think can help the city move forward. Okay. Now, your opponent, Mike Knox, has uh, described you as a Beto socialist. What's your response to that? Well, my response is, first of all, uh, being compared to Beto is fine. Uh, but I think broadly, you know, it's easy to do the name calling, but it's harder to do the governing. And for me, it's all about let's look at the record and what has actually happened. And when you look at um, Councilmember Knox's record, he voted against the pension deal. He's the only council member to do that, which puts him farther to the right than Dan Patrick, who supported that deal. He uh, voted against any new development regulations after Harvey. And so when you have policies that are out of step with Houstonians, you have to go to the name calling, which I believe does not have a place uh, in this election. You've also criticized the uh, incumbent for both opposing the hero ordinance 
and supporting the state's ban on so-called sanctuary cities. Clearly, you think both of those positions are wrong. Why? I do. So, number one, I think, you know, we have to be a welcoming city. That is the most sort of core value of the city of Houston, and that means diversity, tolerance, and respect, whether that's for folks who are in the LGBT community, whether that's for racial minorities, whether it's for folks who are here undocumented. And so, you know, just take SB4 for a second. That was a law that essentially required HPD to cooperate with ICE, number one, and it basically said anybody who gets pulled over, even for a broken taillight, a kid who's been here since they were one year old, a kid who I used to teach, Greg, uh, can be deported simply for that. And I just don't believe those are the kind of laws we need here in the city of Houston, quite frankly. Okay. According to polling and probably your neighbors as well, <laughs> protecting our city from flood water is far and away the biggest priority for voters. If elected to council, what uh, policies would you support to make Houston at least a more flood resistant city? So I think four things we got to do. So the first one is we have to have more parks and green space to detain and retain water. We know that we have way too much runoff. Number two is we have to look at addressing illegal dumping, particularly in our underserved communities where we have trash that builds up in the drains that gets water back in the streets into people's homes. I think having cameras in place, I think expanding the number of dump sites in the city beyond just six. I think number three is we have to look at making sure that the drainage fee is being spent on drainage projects. Uh, and finally, we have to look at sort of innovative solutions like permeable concrete. For example, other cities are doing this. That could help us as well. Raj, you have proposed universal child care and a major expansion of housing to address our, our homeless problem. They are noble goals, but uh, you know, how do you fund them? And, and that's what people are gonna ask. A and would that require lifting the, uh, the property tax cap? So let's just take the homeless issue for a second. You know, if you look at the homeless population at the city of Houston, we have about 4,000 homeless individuals every night. Broadly speaking, in you know, two categories, category one are those with a mental disability or addicted to a substance of some kind. And for, for those individuals, the research is clear, we need permanent supportive housing with wraparound services. And we can get the funding to pay for that by reducing the visits to the ERs that's happening right now for those who are homeless. Because if an individual is homeless and they do not have insurance, they are dialing 911, we are all paying for the ambulance, and they're going either to Bentob or LBJ, we are all paying for those services. If we can reduce those visits, we have the money to make the investments in, in sort of homeless housing or, or this so-called so permanent supportive housing. And so I think broadly speaking, this is gonna take creative solutions. Other cities have done uh, social impact bonds for pre-K and uh, childcare. We can be looking at solutions like that. Um, I think it's less about finding new ways to tax folks, given that we have sales tax sort of capped by constitution, given that we have the rev cap, which, uh, you know, and not to mention the state sort of imposed cap. Now we have to go to the voters for any increase over three and a half percent. And so I think quite frankly, it's going to be creative solutions and engaging the public, private, and nonprofit sector all working together. Okay, here's the hanging curveball. You got 15 seconds. Why should folks vote for you? Three reasons. Number one, I'm going to be the hardest working candidate in this race and once on council. Number two is we're going to be accessible to each and every Houstonian. We're going everywhere regardless of where you are in the city. And number three, we have specific policy solutions to move the city forward. Raj, thanks for taking the hot seat, man. Thanks for having me, Greg. Okay. Okay, still ahead, the increasingly high cost of being politically incorrect. A Canadian icon pays a high price for his opinion. That topic on our table after the break. You people love, you, you they come here, whatever it is, you love our way of life, you love our milk and honey, at least you can pay a couple of bucks for poppies. It's not often that a purely Canadian development jams its way into the Watcher Point rundown, but this week we have a notable exception. This week celebrated hockey analyst Don Cherry was suddenly terminated for those remarks, which appear to criticize uh, immigrants for neglecting to wear a poppy to honor Canada's fallen veterans. Canada Sportsnet criticized his remarks as divisive and unrepresentative of its values. Now, I know this isn't hockey country, but take my word for it, Cherry is famous with a capital F. So was that the right call, or has political correctness become a new form of tyranny? Going straight to Wayne Dolcefino. <laughs> well, look, I try to, to love all people, right? And I don't want to be divisive. But can we all stop whining it is the biggest problem and it's not just an american problem apparently it's in canada too right everyone whines everyone thinks everyone's being mean to them and i just think it's really sad greg <laughs> okay tony you defend all things that are involving immigrants so do you think that was bad should he have been fired well uh, you know what the other thing too is people should be arguing with the corporation because i also think that 
They wanted that guy to go anyway, and that's one easy way to do it because he's brash. Um, you know, I, I don't know much about hockey, <laughs> but if the hockey fans want him back, they should go to the corporation. And really, that, that whole clip right there, you saw it all there. It's like Archie Bunker doing play-by-play. -play. That was nice probably a couple decades ago. So on that other side of the other border, because there's a no the southern border where there's no wall and northern border where there's no wall, makes no sense to talk like that. That's why they wanted him off the air. Okay, 20 seconds each. Go. Blank. Yeah, so political correctness has become a vehicle to oust anyone who says anything remotely disagreeable. You look at Megyn Kelly and her comments on blackface, Donald Sterling when he said some racist stuff at the NBA. All this does is silences the people who say these things and it pushes them back into the shadows. I want my racist, or this guy isn't racist, but I want my racist to be loud and vocal so I know who to avoid. On the road. Cherry and Poppy and veterans, oh my. This is a gentleman who gets in there and says, listen, I want you to support the veterans. This is Remembrance oh Day in Canada. <coughs> Anyone who's not Canadian should be buying poppies. Insane. Okay, tomorrow, Bell. His clothes are so fly. Did you see that blue and yellow jacket? He a uh, uh, scarf he had on and his ensemble with the poppies all over. I didn't even know what the hell a poppy was. I was like, is that a person? Me either. I want, I, I'm, I'm serious, I, I don't watch hockey, but I think that might have been a bit much fire in the guy. That's just my opinion. That's just okay, my opinion. Okay, close this out, Michelle oh Maples. Goodness, this, of course, everything is too politically correct. Everybody needs to relax, and everybody should wear poppies and support veterans. There is nothing wrong with that. Immigrants, citizens, black, white, yellow, purple, wear a poppy. Thank a veteran. Okay, we're going to be right back. City Councilor Mike Knox is in the hot seat. We're going to talk to him in just a moment. Welcome back. Four years ago, the people of Houston chose Mike Knox to represent them on city council in the at-large position one. A 15-year veteran of the Houston Police Department, Knox also served in the United States Air Force and authored a well-regarded book on gang violence. On council, he's been a fiscal hawk looking to get the best value for your dollars and heavily resisting the constant temptation to ask Houstonians for more money. What he is requesting now is another term in office. Mike Knox, uh, thanks for taking the hot seat. Well, thanks for having me this morning. Okay, what did your representation deliver to Houstonians, and why should you get another term? Well, I, I bring a common sense, reasonable uh, approach to government. I think the best form of government is one that applies logic, good judgment, and common sense. And so when I'm on council, I look at things about, you know, how, how does this actually affect the citizens of Houston? And so my positions on many of these issues that come before us, is it a good financial value? Are we getting our bang for our buck? Those kinds of things. Okay, your opponent is unabashedly progressive, <clears throat> and, and he believes, he, he, he reflects Houston uh, in a way that you don't. You don't agree with some of those things like, uh, you know, universal child care mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other programs he suggested. Well, th these kinds of things are very expensive pro projects to do. And we frankly don't have enough money to, to operate our current budget. We operate in a hundred million dollar deficit every single year or more. And so uh, it's a money issue really. And, and really the important thing is if we're going to draw businesses in, make this a, a wonderful place to live, we have to be a little bit business friendly. We, because no one comes to Houston for the weather and they don't come for the for the view they come here to work and raise their families and so we have to be make sure that we provide core services uh, that everyone can use all the time uh, infrastructure drainage all that that sort of thing well speaking of weather and drainage you were on council through the course of three major flood events including mm -hmm. Hurricane Harvey if reelected what policies <laughs> would you support to make all of Houston more flood resistant well, one of the things that we really need to do is start taking care of the little things, cleaning out the gutters, keep cleaning out the ditches, making sure that the water can flow from neighborhoods into the bayous and other waterways on, their way, on its way to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, over the past 30 or 40 years, Houston has been very neglectful of our maintenance of our current facilities. And of course, uh, mid-range, we, we need to start working on improving and, and enlarging some of those structures under the street that can hold more water. And then finally, we need some long-term mitigation uh, with some detention areas. And uh, we are working toward those goals. Councilman, the city of Houston currently has a cap on how much council can raise property taxes. Now, Mayor Turner has advocated lifting that cap. You disagree, you have fought that, why? Well, because Look, we, our revenue increases every year, even though we lower the tax rate, um, because the property values continue to increase. And the citizens of Houston, in a referendum on, on an election, actually 
put a limit on us because they knew that given the opportunity, the Houston, the Houston city government would spend all the money that it brings in plus more. And that's turned out to be the case. In fact, every year, even though we have an increase in revenue, we spend that amount plus another hundred million on, on things that, that uh, really don't have much impact on the average person's life, but it's able to spend political messages and so forth around the country. And, and I think that's improper, and so I fight those. In this case, uh, after Hurricane Harvey, I uh, did an amendment to the mayor's proposal about the tax rate increase um, that would have caused us to collect more than we should have, and uh, I was able to convince 14 of my colleagues to vote with me against the mayor's plan on that, and because that was the right thing to do. Uh, it's not a good idea to raise people's taxes right after a devastating fo uh, storm like Hurricane Harvey. Mike Knox is a former police officer. You know something about being a first responder. Mm -hmm. And you've also had a front row for, for what's been a destructive impasse between the mayor and firefighters. What needs to happen that hasn't happened? Well, what needs to happen is both parties, the fire union president and the mayor of the city of Houston, need to get, to get past the personal conflict that they're having with one another and, and come to an agreement about, I think all of, our, all of us on council want to see our firefighters paid better, uh, but there are a lot of uh, personality issues going on right now between the two, and until those are resolved, I don't see any future um, resolution. Councilman, when you meet face-to-face -face with voters who are undecided mm -hmm. and make your case, what's your first and best argument for re-election? Well, actually, uh, the first and best argument is I represent Houston. And that's ev evidenced by my support that I'm getting on a bipartisan level from people in Houston. Two of my opponents, uh, Georgia Provost and Larry Blackman, have endorsed my campaign. The Chronicle endorsed my campaign. And the reason is because we have a very powerful mayor. And it's important that we have someone on council who can stand up to that power and speak truth to it as necessary. And that's what I bring to the table, is the ability to look at things from a rational, reasonable, common sense approach and be uh, strong enough to, to have an argument and be successful in sort of restraining or putting a break on the awesome power of our, of our mayor. Mike Knox, thanks for taking the hot seat. Thank you. Okay, when we come back, the verdict is in on Roger Stone and it looks like prison for President Trump's longtime friend and supporter. Could a pardon be in his future? We will talk about it after the break. Guilty, Trump confidant Roger Stone convicted Friday on seven felony counts, including lying to Congress and witness tampering. The last of the Mueller probe prosecution, Stone becomes the sixth associate of the president, likely to do time. Tony, are you applauding? <laughs> It is wrong to lie in court. It is wrong to cover up. I think really it was the credibility of President Trump that was on trial. Ugh. And yet one more of his circle is indicted, flips, goes to jail. Again, Trump said he was going to hire the best. He's actually hired the worst criminals. Wayne, uh, Roger Stone was like a black ops political guy. And let me tell you something. If people actually took every text I've ever said and tried to suggest I was like threatening people, I get it all the time. I call someone and ask a question, and then it comes back to me that I've threatened somebody, right? That was Roger Stone's deal. Look, I, I'm uncomfortable with this because I think all of this was based on this real nonsense Russian witch hunt thing. And I think guys like him lied or, or their texts made it look like they were a meaner guy than they were. He's not a mob guy. He was trying to help. Carmen. Criminalizing politics is something that we've yeah. seen more of in the last couple decades, and at, uh, some people have problems with it, other people don't. This was a foregone conclusion. When you're in federal court on seven counts like this, he was going to be found guilty. Yep. Whether he goes to jail for up to 50 years, I guess we're going to find out. But this is something that I'm glad it's over because most people have moved on. Okay, 20 seconds each. Charles. Yeah, I mean, I think we all expected it. We knew this was coming. But I will say that if, New Jersey taught me one thing. It's that when all of your consigliers get arrested, it's probably not good. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I will bring up, Tony said a couple seconds seg segments ago that he didn't trust the justice system, but now he trusts it when it's in his favor, huh? So, oh, no. Uh, <laughs> look, anytime You're giving you him the get arrested penalty? and turn around and have a press conference with everybody on the steps, you know it's going to feud in just a little short time, you ain't going to be able to talk to nobody. So he had his press conference and now he's going to jail. Final word. Final word is if it's wrong to lie in court and if it's wrong to lie or to cover things up, like Tony said, why isn't Hillary Clinton prosecuted? Why isn't James Clapper prosecuted? Yes. And why isn't John Brennan prosecuted? Do those You're next. Leave it right there. Just ahead, Texan Julian Castro 
criticizing lack of diversity in the critical Iowa caucuses. And some in the Hawkeye State say he's got a point. We will talk about it after a quick break. As Democratic presidential candidates descend on Iowa, head of the caucuses, Texan Julian Castro, has made news by publicly ejecting to the Hawkeye State's first in the nation status. Surprisingly, the Gazette, the state's second largest newspaper, partially uh, agrees it is time to reshuffle the primary process. Hmm, Tony, what do you think? Brilliant observation. I love that the Gazette actually thought about it profoundly, and that's what we need to do is keep updating democracy. This is kind of like a think tank. Good job, Julian. Good job, Iowa. Good job, the Gazette. Michelle Maples, yank it from uh, Iowa. Iowa is a complicated process. That's why they're number one. They go, they go to these meetings, they put themselves in groups, and they vote for a candidate. And if your candidate is inviolable, then you get a second choice, which makes them different. They're first because they're complicated. That's all there is to it. Tomorrow, are they too old and too white to be first? <laughs> Iowa supported Obama. Okay, so I, I um, when he had the caucus there, so I don't, I, I can't say that, and I have some friends in from Iowa, and they ain't white, so I'm just saying. Quickly, Charles. <laughs> if the Gazette wants to change it, they need to look at their state legislature. Iowa and New Hampshire both enshrined in their state law that they will be the first caucus and primary, respectively. Right. The only state that looks like the country is New Jersey, and they're not going to move that to the first one, so might as well just keep it there. <laughs> okay, Carmen Rowe. I think change is good, but I think this has more to do with Julian Castro trying to give some uh, credibility to his campaign and to get some focus on him. I don't think this is about it's anything worked. else. Okay, <laughs> Don Dolcefino. Yeah, well, so look, uh, Charles, uh, being from Brooklyn, look, look the, the reality is um, I don't like the way we do this process for a number of reasons, right? Because I think momentum comes, right, with winning Iowa, right? Um, I, I, I would like to see more states vote at the same time. I think that's the better play. Got to stop you there. We'll continue our discussion of all things political with Fox News Sunday and host Chris Wallace. So stay right there.